All right, here we go. Hey, everyone. This is Andy with Modern Military History. Pardon me uh, for kind of my informal look today. Um, I'm making this video on the fly because military history is occurring right now. And um, you gotta be a flex you gotta be flexible. You gotta be flexible when things happen and, and when uh, certain countries get invaded. So I'm making this video today to share perspective that I have on what's happening in Ukraine. We have been hearing for weeks that, Russia might invade Ukraine. And I hesitate to even say Russia might invade Ukraine because that implies the entire country as a whole has unified behind the idea that it is within their best interests as a nation to forcefully impose military might over another country that neighbors on their borders. And that's not the case from all analysis. Russia is run by one man. His name is uh, Vladimir Putin. He has continued to hold power in that country through coercion um, murder and has established an authoritarian regime that operates under the guise of a more liberal government model. It is made to appear through political theater and through obfuscation that Putin is not uh, an authoritarian tyrant. But we all know through following the news, through reading history, which is one of the reasons I am so passionate about military history, is you begin to understand what's real and what isn't in real world events compared to what we're told. And, and Putin tells us that he is not a fascist dictator, an authoritarian dictator who rules through fear, um, murder, um, and coercion, that he has been voted time and time again by the people. But as we know, again, through studying the history, these elections are anything but fair. So it is all of this to make the point that Putin, Putin, Vladimir Putin is invading Ukraine. It is his will that sees this as the best course of action for his best interests. And of course, when you have authoritarianism, the interest of the one and the interest of the state um, are seemingly intertwined. However, it's impossible uh, for just one person to represent the true needs of an entire nation, especially one as large as Russia, I would argue any nation. Authoritarianism doesn't work. It may work for a short period of time, but um, it, I would call it a, a historically short-term and unstable solution uh, to governance. That's not the point. The point is that Vladimir Putin has ordered the invasion of the Ukraine. Why has he ordered the invasion of the Ukraine? Some of you may asking, may be asking. I'm not the most knowledgeable person on Russian and Ukrainian relations. We've all heard for a long time about Ukrainian separatists, Ukrainian war, uh, battles being fought in the Ukraine, um, and, and the shadow involvement of Russian troops either openly acting um, under uh, national identity as such Russian troops or uh, against the Geneva Convention camouflaging themselves um, as, as some other entity. Um, there's a reason that I'm able to speak about 
with strength. Uh, I won't go into what I'm not well versed in, but I will go into what I know. And then I know that historically, for thousands of years, the Ukraine has been the breadbasket of Russia. There's an incredible amount of oil in the Ukraine. There's an incredible amount of fertile land in the Ukraine, mineral deposits. Uh, the Odessa seaport is in the Ukraine where, you know, you can do quite a bit of commerce. There's money to be had by controlling the Ukraine. And there's a reason why in uh, the pre-World War II era of Stalinist communism, the Ukraine was fixated upon by Stalin. You may have heard of the Ukrainian famine. If you want to hear about somebody who experienced firsthand what the Ukrainian famine was like, um, listen to my podcast with Jake Jakovinko. He, he was born um, into a family who had witnessed that and lived through that and seen the brutality and horrors imposed upon the Ukrainian people by the Stalinist regime. So there's a lot of vested interest in controlling the Ukraine. That has, been, that has been historically true, and it remains true today. This situation has been obfuscated by um, Vladimir Putin and the uh, massive uh, military-industrial complex that he controls. Um, you know, there's a lot of... He is trying to create this narrative that, you know, Ukraine, uh, there are people, the separatists in Ukraine, you know, should be allowed to secede to Russia, but that's not his decision to make. That's Ukraine's decision to make. It is the Ukrainian people uh, who are having this discourse. It, it is not Vladimir Putin uh, or the Russian people who are having this discourse. But it's all obfuscating the fact that Putin wants to control Ukraine. He wants to control the resources there. This is a fundamental truth. Um, and, and, and forgive me for not getting very deep with it. Um, as this continues to unfold, um, I want to continue to allow historical perspective from what I do know, but that means I'm going to read a lot more. Um, now, now that this is occurring, I'm going to read a lot more and learn a lot more so I can speak about this um, in a more educated, informed manner. So I'm not giving you any untruths. Because the thing about history, and the thing about history as it unfolds, is that as a, as, a, as a trained historian, as somebody who went to school t for history, the thing that is continually drilled into you is that if you're presenting facts, verify them and make sure that these facts are the absolute best facts that you can be presenting in your argument. So I'm even uncomfortable making this video and saying the things that I'm saying now because uh, this is all just speaking from things that I've learned but I haven't touched a lot on. I've had a lot going on uh, with, the, with my um, studies recently um, that have been pulling me uh, decades in the past, let alone what's happening right now. So uh, while I've been following the events as they've been unfolding, I haven't done an incredible amount of reading into them, and I want to do that for you folks. Now that things are happening, um, I feel like it, it's an important, important thing to be touched upon. And I think warfare has the unique way of engaging the emotional, old, old parts of ourselves that are primarily concerned with fight or flight. And that's why war is such an incredibly important, incredibly intoxicating motivator. That is why bigots, tyrants, authoritarians consistently advocate for warfare, for struggle, for violence. Authoritarianism thrives when there is somebody... It is a shadow-like figure often when you look at it objectively. There's a shadow-like figure who's coming for you, and you are threatened, and I, the authoritarian, can protect you. That's how fascism begins. That's how authoritarian begins. That's how demagoguery begins and incepts its way into rational people. I believe military history and the study therein can help people remove themselves from the inherent emotional 
unsophisticated mode of thinking that war brings and the threat of war brings to a more cerebral area by studying it in a cerebral informed historical manner we can begin to look at war more objectively the mission of what i do the mission of modern military history is to make military history accessible to everybody in the modern age this is the first time, really, I've actually addressed modern military history, i.e. military history happening now in modernity. And that all stems from my mission of trying to get people to think more deeply about war. There's a lot to be talked about here, folks. And I don't want to get too deep into it right now because I haven't done my homework. And I don't want to bring something to you folks that is not the best it can be. I'm too passionate about what I do to put out an inferior product. But sometimes you have to be quick on your feet and you have to do what I'm doing right now. And that's why I'm making this video. That's why I'm on publishing it today. That's why uh, I'm also giving you guys the caveat right now that I'm going to do more work and I'm going to continue to bring you uh, updates from my perspective as a military historian. Speaking of military history, I want to close what I'm saying today. I want to close this video with history that has come to the surface. It has come to the surface in my mind of things that have come up for me watching these events unfurl in the Ukraine. And what these are are selections from a telegram sent from the embassy in the Soviet Union to the Department of State on October the 26, 1962 from um, the former uh, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. This message was sent during the height, the absolute height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I love, I love these words for multiple reasons. Firstly, they're beautifully written. And they're beautifully written under duress. <laughs> As somebody who enjoys writing, I know that it's difficult to write beautifully when you even have years to think about just what you want to say. Nikita Khrushchev banged this out um, with, the, with the help of some aides, I'm sure, relatively quickly. And, and allegedly, it came through in the middle of the night, uh, US time. Um, and it was sent spur of the moment. And to give some overview of another reason I love these words is that it, com it comes from the other side. As an American, um, the fact that these words came from the, quote, opposition in a historical event gives an incredible amount of perceptive value it gives perspective on the past. It gives value to being able to see events as two-sided. What's the other side thinking? Well, they're complex, rational people too. They may be acting in a way that you can't understand, but the fact that you can't understand it means that it's complex. I love these words and I wanted to share them with you folks um, at the to close this video off. These are selections from, tele, from a telegram sent from the embassy in the Soviet Union to the Department of State. Khrushchev wrote, quote, If indeed war should break out, then it would not be in our power to stop it. For such is the logic of war. I have participated in two wars, and I know that war ends when it has rolled through cities and villages everywhere, sowing death and destruction. Khrushchev goes on to say, If people do not show wisdom, then in the final analysis they will come to a clash like blind moles, and then reciprocal extermination will begin. Mr. President, we and you ought not now to pull upon the ends of the rope in which you have tied the knot of war. 
because the more the two of us pull, the tighter that knot will be tied. And a moment may come when that knot will be tied so tight that even he who tied it will not have the strength to untie it. And then it will be necessary to cut that knot. And what that would mean is not for me to explain to you, because you yourself understand perfectly of what terrible force our countries dispose. Respectfully yours, Nikita Khrushchev, October 26th, 1962. I share that message for the reasons I previously said and for the final reason that we have been in dark, dangerous places as a civilization. And I seek comfort in that message. Because that was the point at which the world was on a much tighter tightrope than we now walk. And world leaders, even the other side, the opposition, the enemy, were able to come together and seek a path away from mutual annihilation. But we must be careful. We must think cerebrally. And that's my mission. As a military historian, your resident knucklehead sitting in his very dirty apartment. Oh, and I got to clean up. <laughs> so with that, I end this transmission. Um, and uh, stay tuned for more. This has been Andy with the Modern Military History Podcast, modernmilitaryhistory.com, modmilhist on Instagram, and of course here on YouTube where I'm doing my best to uh, address this military history and my thoughts uh, from my uh, unique perspective um, as they come up. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay calm, and I'll see you next time. Bye.